Good afternoon and welcome to all of you tuning in live to our Acubest webinar, webinar and indeed to all those listening to us on playback. Our topic for discussion today is whether equity markets are disconnected from economic reality and how should investors think their way through this global pandemic and global recession. Just uh, for our people tuning in, you can submit questions during the webinar and I do apologize in advance if we don't get to all of them due to the time restrictions we have today. You can also submit suggestions for topics to be covered in future webinars. Joining me today is Chris Johns. Chris is well known in Ireland. He's an experienced economist and investment, and, and investment strategist. He has served as Chief Investment Officer for Fundamental Equities for State Street Global Advisors for a number of years. He currently writes a column, a weekly column for the Irish Times on a Monday, and he is a member of our or Acubest Investment Committee. Uh, Chris, to start our discussion um, today, I'd like to focus on the performance of the S&P 500, which is a US, as you know, the US stock market. And I'd like to propose that we use the US stock market as, if you like, our case study for today for our discussion, because after all, the US stock market represents over half of the global stock market. And in looking at this chart that I have up for attendees, you know, people will be able to see a very sharp fall in markets all the way through to March 23rd. And that's been followed by a very strong recovery. In fact, up to last night, Chris, Mark, that market was up 42%. And just to set the context for this, um, you know, that strong recovery has been in the context of a global pandemic that hasn't gone away yet, and a backdrop of a very challenging economic picture. And I know today we're not going to focus much on talking about coronavirus uh, per se, Chris, but just to say on the on the global pandemic, you know, the numbers now as of last night are over 8 million confirmed cases worldwide and close to 450,000 deaths. And about a quarter of those are attributable, attributable to the US. Um, and then on the economic front, you know, as recently as yesterday, our own central bank governor described us as dealing with an unprecedented economic shock. And he talked about fantastic levels of uncertainty. So, Chris, with that as a background, you know, what has led to this, you know, strong, strong rebound in equity markets? Well, good, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, John. Thanks for, for that intro. As you say, we're using the US as the um, example here because it is, as you say, over half the world's equity market and the rest of the world's equity markets often follow the lead set by the US. That's because of its economic dominance um, and its uh, also because of the size, the sheer size of its stock market. One of the things to say about the US stock market is that over the long haul, um, it is actually the world's best performing stock market. So that when we're talking about US equities, we are generally talking about the world's best, historically at least. And it's always good to bear that in mind that other stock markets over time have done well, but not as well as the, U as the US. If you look at this chart, you'll see, um, I think a very simple answer to your question which just to remind ourselves was is our equity market is disconnected from economic reality an equity market that's just gone up nearly 50 percent as you have just said first of all that's very unusual it, it happens but it doesn't happen that often um, when equity markets go up like that it's usually because of some good things that are happening um, there has been nothing good during this period so on the face of it, yes, the answer is an unequivocal yes. Equity markets, this one in particular, but also all of the others that take their lead from this are disconnected from reality. But of course, there's um, there's not there's, there's lots of other things going on. First of all, there's, there's the question of what reality is the equity market trying trying to reflect? And there, was, there are two things going on here. One is that it's not contemporaneous. It's not what's going on at the moment. The equity market for all its sins is a forward looking beast and it's trying to anticipate the future as much as it's trying to react to the past, more so than it's trying to react to the past. Um, for, for, for equity markets, the past is a foreign country and frankly today also is as well. It's always about the future. And the equity market is saying quite explicitly here that for all sorts of reasons, the economic consequences of the virus, the financial consequences of the virus are going to be short lived. And of course, it then behoves us to try and figure out whether or not we agree with that conclusion. The second and related reason for the equity market saying um, what it's saying is, is because of economic policy. 
and in particular, but not only, the policy of central banks everywhere. In the case of the United States, it's the Federal Reserve. And in many ways, the Federal Reserve has removed an awful lot of the traditional risks that we think about. Um, you talked about unprecedented times. What the Federal Reserve is doing is unprecedented. In a way, it's taking the lessons that they learned during the great financial crisis, and that was a severe financial crisis, and is saying, right, we're running that playbook now, but we are running it in a massively expanded way. Um, and so th th already we're seeing lots of policy differences as a result of the lessons learned during the financial crisis. And with respect to the central banks of the world, and in this case, as I say, it's the Fed, they've gone early and they've gone really, really hard and they've not hung around waiting to see what happens next before they've announced the next thing that they're going to do. Only yesterday we saw an expanded version of um, something they're doing in the in the corporate bond market. These are debt instruments that are sold by US corporations and indeed others. And this expansion in the Fed's activity, they're just simply going out and buying these bonds um, helped stabilize the market only yesterday. So that and a whole bunch of other measures that they've done, which at the end of the day amount to printing money, has contributed to this idea that the, that the economic consequences, incredibly severe that they are, you know, it's at least as bad in many countries as the Great Depression, not just the Great Recession of a few years ago, that it's going to be temporary. And, and Chris, that's very interesting. And I know that you and I listened to Powell as he gave his comments after his meeting last week. And and while I appreciate he has, you know, given very strong sort of support in terms of the instruments, I was also struck by his messaging. And his messaging was, I would, you know, uh, summarize it as being very cautious about one, the economy, and very concerned about the level of employment in the US, where, you know, there's over 20 million people, and he clearly, clearly seemed to be giving a signal um, that, you know, not all those people are going to get back to work or not get back to work very quickly. Uh, and in fact, that did cause the markets on Thursday to go down quite uh, significantly before, you know, recovering again, you know, through Friday and, and so far this week. So he does seem to be running a tightrope between, on the one hand, managing expectations about the economy and yet putting out the sense that the markets are reacting to at the moment. Any comments on that? Yeah, I think that sends a lot of very useful signals for us to think about how this is likely to evolve from a financial market and an economic perspective going forward. The markets are clearly reacting to what the Federal Reserve and other central banks, including our own, the ECB does. And, we, and I spoke about that and you, you, you spoke about it last week. Um, and that, that's going to remain unchanged going forward. So we're going to see markets very reactive to policy developments and policy not just from the central banks. Um, here in Europe, for example, we've got uh, some pretty chunky fiscal measures uh, coming down the pipe. Um, and I think they're going to be very supportive and they already have been for markets. You also mentioned the virus itself and the way in which the market is reacting to news flow about that. That's not going to change. Um, as we get, as we did only yesterday, some better news about a, a, a pre-existing drug that helps in the treatment, but not cure of coronavirus, that also helps markets. And that's going to continue for going forward as well. If we get more news about uh, positive developments in antivirals and, of course, ultimately a vaccine, that will help. But the way all of that ties in together is how long it's going to take for those developments to occur. And that's why I think Powell was cautious about, about the economy. So, for instance, if we were to get drug treatments today that sorted this problem out, I suspect Powell would, would strike a much brighter note about the employment picture in particular and the yes. economy in general. But if we're still talking about this in the spring of next year, and we've gone through series of mini lockdowns or, or second and third waves, I think Powell's um, caution about the uh, employment and economic outlook will be very, very well placed. So we're in a dynamic process, which essentially boils down to how soon can we uh, get the coronavirus dealt with in some, in some way better than we are at the moment. And there are some positive steps, as I've mentioned, that we, it's positive developments that we've seen. We need to see more of those. Once we've reached that point in the market, in, in the, in the uh, pa uh, pandemic's evolution that we, we can conclude that it's being dealt with, we'll then go back to watching all of the other stuff that we're more used to, which is the economic news. And that's when we'll know whether Powell's pessimism was justified or not. And if there are permanent economic consequences of this that are quite severe, 
then that optimism that you see in this chart in front of you will also have seen will be misplaced. Um, but on the you know to to to, to uh, be optimistic about it, which is probably where I sit on on this, albeit cautiously, is that um, given the amount of stimulus that they have done already and the amount that they are planning to do, when that day comes, hopefully sooner rather than later, that we focus entirely on the economics and not so much on the pandemic, the news flow will be actually quite positive. Yeah, and that makes sense to me. Just just switching it up a little bit here. So on this graph that we're looking at the moment, we can see the strong recovery, but I think it's also fair to say, and I'm just going to move it on um, to another um, uh, graph here. And um, when we look at what is what has made up because the, the recovery, because when I look at this graph that's showing for people now, this is an effect and I'm a fond believer in data visualization. So pictures that can tell a thousand stories. So what we're looking at is the performance of the S&P 500 uh, from the start of the year up to last Wednesday. In fact, is when Paul was speaking and just to orient uh, our viewers to this. So at the top, the size of the box and the color of the box gives you a lot of information. So the larger the box that relative to the overall market capitalization, the S&P 500, and the color then tells you whether on the basis up to last Wednesday, whether that stock was up or down relative to on a year to date basis. So I'm on anything that's uh, what I call black or green is essentially as at this stage has met back. It's back to where it started the year or is strongly ahead. And I think that's on the sort of the purple to red side, they are still lagging behind from where they started the year. So you will see companies like the top left, that's Microsoft. You can see that it's both a large part of the overall index and you can clearly see what the number isn't shown there that is positive. So it's, it's been up 20 to 30%. Um, so I wonder just for our listeners, Chris, if there's anything we, we can gain, or any knowledge we can gain, because it seems to me that there's a divergence in what's happening at the various sectors. Absolutely, John. There's there's an awful lot going on in this slide. Um, I too am a fan of data visualization, and I think this explains very well, or at least brings out uh, some of the stuff that's going on underneath that basic chart that we just showed you, which was the market as a whole, and this is what's going on underneath it. And there's lots going on. The most obvious thing are those very big green boxes, which are those technology stocks that we're all in various ways familiar with. Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, Google, Amazon, um, Netflix, and one or two other very familiar names. The, the, the numbers, the percentage increase in the, in the share price of stocks like Amazon and Netflix this year has been nothing short of remarkable. Some of these companies, we, it was only a year or so ago that we were remarking on how it was, it was quite something to see some of these companies pass past the trillion dollar uh, cap market capitalization that th this is what their overall uh, worth was and that's yeah, one that. that's one followed by 12 zeros now some of these companies are, are, are we're now speculating uh, speculating them about them reaching two trillion it, it, it is quite remarkable and and jeff bezos becoming if not already the richest man in the world as a result of his his shareholding of amazon now a year a year or so ago, it was quite fashionable, and indeed, I think I was one of the people pushing this idea that the the run up in these stocks, which has been going on for some time, was getting out of hand and was becoming somewhat detached from fundamentals. Um, and if you looked at the earnings and the market share and all the other fundamental things that we look at, we could we could see some justification for what was going on, but it was starting to look a little stretched. So there was a lot of skepticism about how much further this could continue. But boom, it's boy, has it continued. And frankly, I've changed my mind as well, because I think one of the things that coronavirus has done is that it's taken established trends that were in place prior to the pandemic and put and accelerated them greatly. So we're speaking using technology now that many people will not have used, or if they have, they haven't used it very much, but they are gonna be using a lot more going forward. And I think that this, this, this type of technological transformation that was, taking place earlier has been accelerated greatly and that is going to continue once the pandemic ends and these share prices reflect in part at least that transformation more yeah, generally it's, it's, sorry, sorry go ahead John yeah because I see an audience question coming in there and it's, it's one that I've heard a lot over the years and it's this question about the big tech stocks because they're probably now between them when you see those those squares there between them they make up close to a fifth of the um, S&P 500 
And a question that's come up and I've heard it many times is, you know, should investors consider investing in these so-called big tech stocks at, you know, at these levels? Um, because the narrative certainly for, as you've alluded to there the last few years is that perhaps there's a bubble in these. And yet what actually happened when in our previous graph markets collapsed, these were the very ones that actually pulled ahead rather than sort of uh, being a bubble in them. Yeah, and what, what's impressive about these stocks as well is, and, and this is the extent to which it, this uh, tech thing that's going on now is very different to the one that took place 20 years ago at the end of the last century coming into um, when it peaked in March 2000, is that there was very little fundamental justification for it back then. This time there is, and by fundamental justification, I mean the profits, the earnings of these companies are amazing. We live in general, not just in this space, in in, tech, in technology companies, but we seem to live in a increasingly a winner takes all world. And the earnings power of these companies is remarkable. They are producing the numbers in a fundamental way that didn't happen back then. So um, there is an extent to which it isn't a bubble, um, uh, and that's to do with their profits. So that's a reason for saying, yeah, you need some exposure to this. I wouldn't have all of your money in the, in, in these stocks, but I do think there's there's an argument for saying some. The, yeah, the, I, the, the I problem. I think that's a good point, Chris, because I think it's important, you know, for our listeners, it's not that we'd recommend sort of concentrating into these, but I think to the extent that they're part of the S&P 500 in many ways, you know, we are uh, relaxed about them. You know, I was struck yesterday, another piece of news that came out yesterday was in relation to uh, the EU Commission and its further uh, antitrust cases against Apple, and it happens to be the case in point. And I suppose the more general point that uh, you and I and our investment committee have spoken about is that, you know, it's likely if some of these stocks, you know, who seem to have very good business models, possibly suited to the future way of working, that maybe the greatest threat for them in the medium to long term is if, you know, so if there's regulation or if they're forced to break up in some way. But listen, I, I'm just conscious in time. I, I would like to, I know that uh, you have some interesting views just on, on the relationship uh, between GDP and, uh, in other words, the economy and between stock markets. And I'm just going to push on the slide a little bit here to something and allow you just to chat a little bit more about that, if I may. Sure. So, so you might what, explain for listeners yeah. there, you know, what we're looking at. And I, and I guess this is in the context of our original question, you know, um, you know, are, are stock markets disconnected from economic reality, which I know you've answered, you know, they are, but I think you're going to just chat about that in a broader sense now. Sure, this is a chart. It's a, in a way, it's a kind of a quiz for our audience, for you and our audience. I'll let you give you the the answer um, in, in a couple of minutes because uh, I haven't revealed which economy we're talking about here. But this is where I link the economy and the stock market for this particular country, um, going back to the uh, last few years of, of the last century. So we're going back to 1997 and it's a neat chart because it shows the black line, which is um, the economy. And you can see in the middle of this chart, the great financial crisis, um, which led to uh, a fairly deep recession in this and indeed many other countries. And you can see GDP actually fell during that time. And at the very right hand side of the chart, you can see up to date data where the black line has collapsed. And this takes us up to April, May of this year, all the way back to basically where this economy was at the start of the 21st century. The first thing that you can say about something like this, when you look at the green line that I've overlaid on this chart, which is the stock market, is that the is the equity market is much, much more volatile than the economy. But the economy does act like a gravitational well for the stock market. It does eventually pull the stock market back to something of a, what we call fundamental reality. It doesn't happen very often. It doesn't last very long, but it is a powerful magnet. And it is that a fundamental drive. Ultimately, fundamentals matter over the long term. But over the short period where you see this green line going up and down for all sorts of reasons, the economy doesn't seem to matter very much. And that's true for this country that we're talking about here. And it's true for pretty much everyone that we look at. So you can see in the early part of the chart, the green line was coming down a lot as the tech bubble of the last century burst. Then there was a recovery. The economy wasn't doing anything either way in both periods, but the stock market was doing quite a lot. The stock market anticipated the downturn in the economy that was caused by the financial crisis. The stock market started coming down early. That's often the way, and it speaks to what I was saying at the beginning of this little chat, where stock markets always try to anticipate what the economy is going to do. Um, and you can see right at the very end, that the stock market and the economy collapsed pretty much at the same time, and the same time being the onset of the pandemic. 
But of course, the stock market did actually get it early. The stock market went ahead of this data in the sense that this data has only just been released and um, the stock market got it right. Um, and the stock market is now recovering and the economy isn't. Um, the answer to the quiz is this is the UK economy that's familiar, I, I would imagine, to, to most people um, listening into this chat. And this is another example of the stock market recovering, not to the same extent as the US, but certainly recovering a lot when the economic news flow has stayed um, very poor. And it's another example of what I was saying earlier, that this is the UK stock market saying things are bad, they're going to stay bad for a while, but they aren't going to stay bad forever, that we are going to get out of this. That's the message that the stock market is trying to send. OK, that's, that's very interesting, Chris. So, I mean, I think that, you know, to paraphrase where we are so far, I think we are saying there's, a, there's clearly a disconnect between the markets and the economy and what you've summed up there is, but that can happen and it has happened historically. So uh, because of the reasons you've just cited, I think that brings a very practical question for uh, our clients, our investors, investors to see but how should investors think about investing in equities at this particular point in time and in particular um, if people have a good deal of cash should they be investing in equities at this, these levels and if it's okay Chris I may just start this part of the discussion if I may because um, as you know I have some pretty strong beliefs around this and, and one of them is fairly straightforward I believe it's important that an investor is very disciplined in their thinking and they have an investment plan and an overall strategy and there are a few elements in particular that I would highlight in those um, and one is something that I referred to as purpose and you know from a philosophical point of view we often say to our clients it's not so much about what the money about the money per se but it's what the money can enable and getting them to focus on that which believe me is something that maybe people haven't had a chance to think about that in the past the second question is very closely related uh, to that and again a very practical question you know do I have enough to do the things that I want to or need to do and a third one is what in fact is my investment uh, time horizon and in no particular order I, I might start with that last one Chris which is if we take time horizon and just say I, I truly believe that pretty much as an industry, we don't spend enough time really teasing that out with people so that they can actually help them understand their time horizon. And unfortunately, I feel far too often this time horizon is skirted around as part of a sales process, you know, trying to get somebody into a particular product or fund. And the reason why I think time horizon is re really matters is that when it comes to investing in things like equities, I think we can say, you know, the likes of you and I, Chris, can say a lot more about equities with some confidence when we're talking about it in the long term. And I'm just pulling up, um, as we as I speak here, another chart. Now this is, we started this discussion and we looked at the performance of the S&P 500 over the last essentially uh, five and a bit months. And what I'm doing is putting that now into the context of the S&P 500 over the last 30 years. And please forgive my scribbles on this chart. On the very right top hand corner, that's the one we've been chatting about. That's the little down leg you've seen and the sharp recovery. The previous two circles, just to orient uh, viewers, the first one on the left, that's sort of the dot-com bubble. And then the one there, uh, the second one is the financial crisis, which Chris, you've already referred to. And I've drawn a line um, and I just really to sum up our beliefs that over the long term, we do believe and have confidence that equities can provide a very useful sort of growth engine to uh, families and their household investment portfolios. I think that's an important point to say. And the other thing I would say is that as we look forward, um, probably mostly driven by the fact that we're now at very, very low interest rates, I think as a firm, our expectation is the line will be upward sloping, but maybe not as steep as it's been for the, as it's been for the last 30 years. Is there anything that you would add to that or comment on that, Chris? Absolutely, John. And uh, this chart, um, in a way, replicates the one I drew, the, the green line in the previous chart for, for the UK. Lots of ups and downs over short periods of time. Sometimes those short periods can be quite prolonged. They can be a number of years, as, as we saw 2000 to 2003. And just over a decade ago, there was a multi-year problem for equities. But with the right time horizon, you will see that the slope of this line, that's your arrow, always goes up. Um, when I started in this business, I was actually one of those people that tried to take advantages of the, advantage of those ups and downs. That's uh, probably more better described as trading rather than investing. And it was an era where people did try to do it. And some of us were successful, some of us weren't. 
um, successful. It, it, it all depends on how talented what your investment edge is, what your investment process. I wouldn't advise anybody to try and do that anymore because I emphasized that it was people trying to do it. These days, this market that you're looking at, the daily num the daily activity in this market, 70 to 80 percent of it is conducted by machines. So if you're going to try and take advantage of those short term swings, not only perhaps as you were in the past competing against very smart, very well informed people, you're competing against machines. What you must try and exploit is not those daily movements, but that arrow. And I would agree with you 100 percent, John. I think that arrow remains upward sloping. I think that um, the slope will come down a bit. I think there are lots of reasons why the future returns from these equity markets won't be as healthy as they have been in the past. But I do think that they will be positive over time. Well, thanks. And that brings me to my, my second point that I often come into in processes is come back to that question of do I have enough? So I have said that I believe very often not enough time is focused on time horizon. But on my next graph here, this is how we help um, our clients think about that question in a very disciplined way. And this is just for an example and for illustration purposes, but just again, just to orient the viewers. So what we're looking at here is how somebody's balance sheet might progress from their starting off at age 53 all the way through to their mid 90s. And it's designed and there's a lot of, see a lot of sophistication going on behind the scenes here because what it's doing is on a yearly basis, it's figuring out what uh, income and cash requirements they have each need and it's drawing in a very smart way from the appropriate pots in order to meet those needs and obviously if somebody's picture ran out of money that would be a particular concern this particular example you can see here that by their mid-90s this particular household has you know 4.8 million in my example here just to orient the people again just to what's going on here in the colors it's just to give it a bit of texture because it helps people to figure out i wonder what my picture looks like so the purple in this particular diagram represents their home or uh, any other investment properties or indeed any liquid investments that they might have. Pink is cash, blue is investments and green is their pension. So again, uh, in this particular example, this person was retiring around 65 um, and then starts to draw down on their pension. So that green starts to shrink through time. And the reason I bring this up is, I, I again, I think that this is something that I found in practice. We can talk all we like about investing and investment ideas but it very much starts at getting people to focus on what is it that I want to do? What is it that the money is for? You know, when do I need it? Do I have enough? And then we can start to make improvements on that picture. So if someone might say to me, there's a lot of pink there, there's a lot of cash, you know, can I do better by investing in stock market and other markets and the chance and, and over a long time horizon and what, how much better might I do? So we look at those. Uh, in that context. And I just wonder, have you any thoughts on that? Because to me, this has been one of the key things that I've learned in working with people, you know, over the last couple of years is uh, that they have found insightful, helping them figure out this question, do they have enough for what they mm. want to do? And I, I think that approach is absolutely right, um, because in my experience of dealing with professional investors, institutional investors, and, and with individuals, the key thing is always trying to get them to think about the issues um, that are important. Um, that might sound a little bit arrogant because, um, but one of the things that you often see is, is people, institutions and individuals actually asking the wrong questions and spending far too much time and far too much energy on the issues that will not produce the outcome that they want. So it starts with asking the right questions. And sometimes it can get quite philosophical because um, one of the questions that you often see people asking themselves quite naturally is how much is enough? Now that is, open-ended um, and in, frankly there is no answer to that question because it, it, perhaps the only answer to that question is more that's how most people seem to answer it but it's subtly different to ask yourself how much do i need that that produces uh, that's a closed question to which you can produce very precise answers and therefore produce quite um, well-defined investment strategies investment policies to meet your needs and I think this is absolutely correct, though, to ask the right questions. And what I pulled up there as you were speaking, Chris, uh, because I'm conscious of time and we're into our last sort of just minute, minute and a half, um, is just this idea that, you know, one of our strong convictions is people need to have a disciplined process to think about investments. And we've put that up there to, really to give people ideas about what's involved in a good, robust process. Um, and, you know, we won't, we're, like I said, we're tight on time, but one of the things is this, you know, having a disciplined process and thinking about it does 
does still leave room for people to express themselves uh, and express them terms in terms of the ideas uh, and opportunities that might be out there. And I am conscious of it, but I just thought we would, we'd be worthwhile, you know, if, if we were to say what's one idea or one area in the long term that you would say uh, for people looking at investing in equity. So let's assume that maybe they follow some of our philosophy. They've got a broad exposure already at the core of their equities to a broad basket of global stocks. Um, you know, wh where do you think, where, what are, name two trends for me, and I'm going to keep you to 30 seconds here, Chris, just because we're just going a little bit over time. Yeah. Um, the two things that I would um, highlight for people to have a look at, because I think it speaks also to to, to personal development and growth. The first is, is um, uh, climate change in particular and ESG portfolios in general. ESG stands for environmental, social and governance. And it's 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 about a more responsible way of, of managing money for both institutional and personal investors. And I think that speaks to a lot of the trends that, we're, that, that are clearly evident in all of our lives at the moment. And the second area that I would focus on is, is the changing role of technology, not just for the reasons that I discussed earlier on about the, the, the Amazons and Microsofts of this world, but there's lots going on as well. The other big trend that I think is going to be accelerated uh, by the pandemic is the move to automation of many different processes, not just these kinds of video calls. OK, and with that, I'll just try and wrap up, if I may, Chris. So first of all, listen, guys, in answer to our questions, our view is the, the equity market is disconnected from economic reality at the moment, but I think we've explained why that uh, may make some sense. Um, we would suggest that people use this time to uh, make a plan in terms of what they're doing and focus on what really matters and what you really want to do. I mean, if one thing I've learned from this pandemic, it, it's forced all of us to pause and reflect on our priorities. And in a sense, one of our things is and encourage people to live the life they want. So with that, I'd like to thank our audience for tuning in. Um, and apologies, we didn't get to all of the questions just to the type time restrictions, but we'll come back to you. Uh, individually on those if we may and secondly I wanted to thank Chris for his time today and with that we'll sign off thank you very much Chris thank you